Let's take it from verse 11. We've, uh, we go through the Bible verse by verse here. So we've, uh, we've arrived at, this is an amazing book. It's just a beautiful book. So we've arrived at this point in uh, verse 11 where we are told to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather to rebuke them. That's where we got to last time. And then it goes, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. And the word shame there, it's a shameful thing. Uh, it's translated as, the word is actually filthy, you know, in the book of Titus, uh, in the book of Peter. And so it's talking about things that you'd be embarrassed to say to your wife or your kids, you know in front of your family, some of the jokes that are told and the stories they tell, it's shameful to even speak of things that are done by them. And it's like today, there's a word in the Bible, the old uh, King James Bible, and it's wantonness. And that's when not only is there no shame about what they say or what about they do, but they flaunt it, they brag about it. That seems to be the culture we're in right now that they flaunt their immorality and so forth. So here, it is shameful to even speak of those things. But verse 13, all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light and for whatever makes manifest is light. It's an interesting verse. And uh, you know, now that we belong to Jesus, you know, there are times when the Lord's going to shine his light upon our hearts, upon our lives, in order to reveal things to us by his spirit, some of the things that need to change in our attitude, in, our, in the way we act, things in life. The spirit will put his searchlight on us and say, you know what, Owen, that needs to change. It needs to change. You know, this thing you're doing has got to go. It's time to make a change. This is what this verse is talking about. How that it is his light, his spiritual light, that exposes the things that need to change. It might happen in, you know, it happens, I think, when we're praying or meditating on the Lord or upon his word as we sit alone with the Lord, suddenly realize, you know what? My attitude's not right. I'm saying things that I shouldn't say. I need to change, you know? And it's the Lord revealing something to you. And it, it could be saying, look, I disapprove of some of the language, the way you speak. I don't like what you're doing, Alwyn. And so we say, Lord, help me. Because I know there are things in my life that need to change. And that's the Lord's doing. It's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. When he reveals something that needs to go or change, and he'll convict us. Because we are his children, he will convict us of things that do need to ch change like that. But he's not, when he convicts us of, of those things, though, and when we see them in our own lives, it's not because he's condemning us. He doesn't condemn us. Jesus didn't come to condemn. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So he's not come to condemn He'll convict you about it, but he's not going to condemn you about it. But rather, what God is doing is, in your life is because he does this because he loves you. He shows you things that need to change because he loves you. And because he's continuing the good work that he has begun in your life. In conforming us now into the image of Christ, you see. So, if he reveals things in our lives that need to change... That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. God is, what, what he's doing is a good thing. And we need to yield to that when we hear that. Lord, I, I can see that there's something here that's not right. We need to yield to that and begin to be aware of it and ask the Lord to help us change things. Christianity is not just, not just a belief system. It's not just a, a theology, but it's a living relationship with the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, where hour by hour, day by day, he's seeking to grow us up 
and raise us up as being his own dear children. That's how he calls us. His own dear sons and daughters. That's how he thinks of us. He's seeking to raise us up into spiritual people, spiritual men and women. And he does it because he loves you. And he's sanctifying your life. He's separating you from the chaff. Continuing the good work that he has begun. Conforming you into, the Christ, into Christ's image. So we know, we know that he's not doing it to condemn us. Because all the condemnation that was due to our sins. Past, present, future. Is all paid for. 2,000 years ago on the cross. So there's no condemnation at all upon us who are his children. Romans 1, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So there's no condemnation. And we understand that first part of that verse. And I want to just talk about this for a second, because we understand the first part of that verse. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. We, we understand that. But the part that confuses people is when you get to the second half of that verse. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. What does that mean? There's no condemnation to those who walk not after the flesh, but according to the spirit. Well... That second part of Romans 8 there is simply a description of what, it, of what a Christian is. It's just a, a description of a Christian. A Christian is someone who is no longer walking according to the dictates of the flesh, but is now a spiritual man, born again of the Spirit, and he's been brought into this new life of walking after the Spirit. And so the second part of Romans 8.1 is simply a description of the Christian. And so we mustn't make a mistake when we read that by thinking that Paul is talking about two different classes of Christians. One who walks after the flesh, still under condemnation. One who walks after the spirit is not under condemnation. No, that whole verse there is simply a description of a believer who has put their faith in Jesus Christ. So let me paraphrase, let me paraphrase it for you this way. There's no doubt about what's being said here. He says, Romans 8.1 there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, whose manner of life now is no longer according to the dictates of the flesh, as it once was, but is now, his manner of life is according to the Spirit. We, we talked about it last week. We are now slaves of righteousness. We are born again. Now we belong to Jesus, the general tenor of our life as a Christian is that we're now under the influence of the Holy Spirit primarily than we are of being under the influence of the flesh like it used to be. So it's Paul's just, it's his description of what a Christian is. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ who walk According, who do not walk according to the flesh as they once did, but are now born again and walking according to the Spirit. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light for whatever makes manifest these things that we have to change is God's light, his spiritual light. It might come through the word of God, it might come through being in fellowship with your brothers, you know, I need to, uh, I said something there I shouldn't have said, you know, and that, it, it's the Holy Spirit going, Alwyn, that needs to change. In the fellowship, that can happen. However his correction may come, it's him that's doing it, so that we then might know what is good and acceptable to the Lord. It's a relationship we've got. It's a beautiful thing. And therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Paul says here, look, wake up, quit sleeping. I could have easily have said that this morning. No, it was very difficult to say that this morning. Wake up, quit sleeping. You're taking a nap, and he's talking in a spiritual sense here. You're snoozing, 
You're unaware of the days that you are living in. You don't understand really what's going on. Wake up. Wake up to what's going on. Just take a good look at what's going on in your life, in your home. Wake up. You young people who are not married yet, you know, you're jeopardizing all that the Lord wants to do for you and wants to do through your life. But you, you can't do it through you. You know why? Because you're compromised. Wake up. Wake up. There are some young men and women I've come across in my time as a pastor in ministry and so forth who could have turned this world upside down. Young people. Made a real mark for the Lord. They could have. They started out well, but you know what? They got influenced by the world. They're snoozing through the stuff of this culture. They got caught up in it. And because of it, they are ineffective. Because this culture has captured them and has destroyed them spiritually, crippled them spiritually. They're asleep to what the word of God says. When it says, do not be partakers with them in their filthiness. They fall asleep to it. And their coarse jesting, their filthy language, uncleanness, fornication, pornography. And because of it, they're just not effective for the purposes of God. And where they could have been used greatly, God can't use them because they're compromised. The world has just taken them in, you know, it's just they're compromised with this stuff. Wake up, though, and he will help you. He will show you the way. Wake up. Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead. Far too often believers have melted into the scenery to the point where there's, they are totally indistinguishable from non-believers. They just go along with stuff. We become so overwhelmed by all this stuff that's going on out there in the world to the degree where we've even now begun to approve of those things. The church. But here God is saying that we are to wake up from these things, you know, stand your ground and be counted as a Christian. Stand up, man. Come out from amongst them. Be separate, says the Lord. Time to wake up from the spiritual apathy. Stand apart, you know. Be what you say you want to be. There's a lot of pressure being put on churches these days for the church to become more relevant you know to the times that we are living in for the church to get in line with the culture in order to get in step with what's going on in society and what they they're coming under the, this idea that in order to win the world we need to become more like the world if we become more like them people will come in more people will go to church because they're just like us. One of the saddest things that has happened to the church right now is this desire not only to be like, not only to be like the world, but also to be liked by the world. We want to be liked. The church is obsessed with it. It wants the world to know that we're no really, not really any different to what they are. Listen to what the Lord says about these things in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul here describes a spiritual condition of mankind in the last days. What it will be like, what people will be doing in the last days as we come to this final generation before the Lord's return. But know this, 2 Timothy 3, 4, in the last days, perilous times are coming. Dangerous days, days that will be very dif difficult for a Christian to live in. Men will be lovers of themselves, self-absorbed completely, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers of God, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. I think Sam Smith's got a song with that going, unholy without natural affection. The idea is there's no natural love between people. No love for family. Unforgiving, slanderous, without self, 
control, brutal, despisers of good. People have no love for that which is good. And where good will be called evil, and evil will be called good. Those days are coming, they're here now. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And then in verse 5, this is Paul's last comment of that, how that culture will be. They will have a form of godliness, but denying its power. From such, you must turn away. They're going to want to have a religion, a form of religion, with no power in it, though. This is what will be going on within the last day's church. They will have a form of godliness, but will deny, deny the power of it. Paul says, look, you need to understand that the time is going to come when every foul thing is going to be embraced by the church. They want to embrace a form of religion, but deny the power of it, which means that the things of the church, the people, the church, will deny in these last days the gospel of Jesus and the word of God. They'll get rid of that. They want to get suppress that. And so when you think of how the church is now, with all the uh, political correctness that's going on and how it's now embracing the morality of unbelievers and embracing the way that they are telling us how we should be. How that the church itself is embracing what the unbelieving world has to say about creation. How the church now is mocking those within it who believe in the creation account of Genesis. Certain parts of the church mock those who believe such things. Christians who believe that. They mock that idea. And how dare you ever believe that marriage is just between a man and a woman? The church is saying that. How the church today is mocking all other parts of the church that believe in the creation account, who believe in the rapture of the church, the return of Jesus Christ coming to establish his kingdom. In the church, we are embracing gay marriage, embracing practicing gay ministers, and people are being taught, oh, it's okay for couples to live together as long as they love each other. We're embr the church is embracing all of this stuff. Paul says, wake up from these things. From such things, turn away, you know? So the last day's church, is one of the, it wants to be religious, but they don't want to hear the power of the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ that brings us from darkness to light and sets us free from all the filth and the mire and the stuff that's going on in the world. The last day's church is going to want to be religious, but they don't want to hear about that kind of stuff. And when Paul says, for such you must turn away, the idea is you must be continually turning away from that idea, all, all of that stuff. And I do believe that Paul is speaking, what he's speaking about here is to this generation, to this generation of the church. All this pressure put on the church for the church to become more relevant, get in line with culture, get in line with society, because they think then, they think, well, you know, to, to win the world, we've got to be like them. But that, that is a huge, massive mistake. Because you see, if we're not really different to the world, then we've got nothing else to offer them. We've got nothing to offer them. Other than what they already have. So why bother with the church at all? And this is one of the things that is so twee about the church today, as it's perceived in many parts. It's promoting itself as, hey, you know what? We're just like you. Don't be threatened by us. Don't be afraid of us. Be, don't be intimidated because we're just like you. Just come on in and you'll find a cup of tea and uh, you'll see that there's no difference between you and us anyway. So just come in. That's, the, that's how they think. We're all inclusive and you'll feel comfortable with us. You're not going to do anything. We're not going to do anything that makes you out of place or feel out of, pray, out of place, you know? But this is a big mistake on part of the church because it's actually the fact that we are different that ultimately attracts people to Jesus Christ. The fact that we are different. 
That's what makes them interested. That's what creates in other people a thirst for spiritual things. The difference that they see in your life. If there's no difference, then there'll be no interest. Now, I don't know what condition you were in when you came to know Jesus, but when I came to know the Lord, I didn't want a Christianized version of what, what, what I was already doing. I didn't want a Christian, Christianized version of what I was doing anyway. If that's all that was go, it was ever going to be, then I wouldn't have given five minutes thought to it. And the idea that Jesus came to make good men better rather than the truth that he came to make dead men alive, that's the Christianity I was looking for. And when I heard it, I recognized it. I was a dead man, and I knew it. Dead in my sins. I wanted to know somebody who could give me a miracle and raise me up out of all of that stuff. And when I found Jesus, he was the one who did it. It's only when we stand apart as the child of God, of, of children of God, and hold to what we know is true, it's only then that people can see that there's an alternative to the questions that I'm asking. It's then that I'm showing that my faith in Jesus is not some casual thing that I've kind of just added to my lifestyle but rather it's something that's transformed my life, has changed my life. And only that will give others something else to long for, something that this world and this culture isn't giving them. So we must wake up, stand apart. We must, come, we, you know, we should never come to a non-believer with the attitude that says, you know what, hey, look, look at us, see, you know, we're just like you, we're not much different. We should never come to a non-believer with that attitude. No way. Because you know what? We are to be really different. Very different. We're not to be at all like non-believers anymore. Because when I come down to their level and act like they do, thinking they're gonna bring, that's going to bring people to Christ, not only is it not going to bring them to Christ, but it might, even make me, it might even bring me to where they're at. It might have the opposite effect. It's when you stand apart as a child of God and hold to what is true. It's then that men and women sit up and take notice because they can see an alternative standard. And then that gives the unbelievers something to long for that's, that's, uh, that uh, this culture that is not giving to them. So we must stand apart. Awake, Paul says. Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead. Get out of that stuff. And Christ will give you light. And then he says, see then then, in the light of that, work, walk circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise. The word circumspect comes from a Latin word. Circum means circular, circle, round. Spect means to see, circumspect. Seeing, looking around, look around. Seeing from a circle. And that's what we're supposed to, we're supposed to be looking around. We're supposed to wake up and realize what's going on in our world the way we're living, the direction we're going in. Look around, see what's going on. To be fully aware from a biblical spec, uh, perspective of what's really going on in the world, and we are the people that can see it. We are to be aware of the fact that as Christians, we're actually soldiers who are behind enemy lines. We are in enemy territories as Christians in this world. And we've been called to a warfare. And so like a soldier behind enemy lines, we're to be looking around, diligent, fully aware of what's going on, so that we're never going to get blindsided by stuff. You're not to be tricked. We're not to be fools in this world. Where you can say, you know, I know where that stuff comes from. It's from the enemy. 
That's a trick over there. It's a deception. I'm not going to be fooled by that stuff. You have to be vigilant. Walk circumspectly, checking out everything in the light of what God says. And then we're walking in line with that. Keep your eyes on the destination. And we're supposed to walk in a certain way in front of other people. How that we, and show them how that we've come from darkness to light. And so we are to walk as children of light. Verse 16. We are to be redeeming the time. Because the days are just fine. No. Evil. The days are wicked. And redeeming the time just simply means to take every opportunity you can to live for, for the Lord. Make use of your time wisely. No, don't waste your time. The word redeem means, redeeming the time means to buy back. And so here God says that you and I as children of the light are to buy back every opportunity that comes our way to serve God using our time just as if you had to pay for it. As if time is precious. That's the idea. People say, how do you spend your time? God says, time is a valuable thing. It's the most precious thing in, in your life. Time, the time that, that you've got. But the problem is, we've only got so much of it. So treat your time as being something, a precious thing. Treat your time as if it's precious and if, as if you had to pay for it. It's precious to you. So the idea is don't waste your time because time is a commodity that we all have, but it's all running out on everybody. Whether you know it or not, we're all running out of time. All of us. Every second that goes, you can't buy it back. Time flies, they say. Anybody who's above 50 will tell you that. Suddenly you're 70. But the problem is, when you're 20, you don't believe time flies until you get there. And then you think, man, where did that go? But take it from somebody who knows by experience, time flies. Somebody says, do you love life, you know? If so, then don't squander it. Don't waste it. Don't waste your time. Because that's the stuff that your life is made up of, time. Treat time as a resource. Spend it wisely. And uh, the time word here is not simply referring to time that's spread out chronologically from birth to death, you know, a chronological time. The word, that, uh, the word here is, is chronos. And, um, but the redeeming of the time, it means seize the day, seize the moment, redeem the moment. That's the idea. Um, you've heard that saying, carpe deum, which means seize the day. That's what Paul is getting at here as well. That as wise men and as wise women were to walk in this world to buy up every precious moment, use it wisely to serve the, with, and with every opportunity that comes to you at that moment, seize the day. There's going to be seasons in our lives as Christians where there will be an open door that suddenly appears before you. And when that happens, we are to seize the day. Some of us, you know, you've witnessed to somebody for years, months and years. You've witnessed to your auntie, tried to witness and witness to her. But she's still mean. She's still cantankerous. It doesn't seem like anything's going on. But one day, she turns around and says, well, tell me what I need to do then if I want to know Jesus. Suddenly, you get a moment like that. And you reply, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, You're so used to debating and arguing 
You can't believe that then suddenly there's an opportunity right there. Right there. I had that moment this week with my guy who cuts my hair. It was a moment. I've been waiting for this moment. I've been going, going to haircuts thinking, Lord, open the door. Conversation. And it suddenly came. A moment came. And I had an hour witnessing to him. It was great. So if I come to church, you know, in a couple of weeks' time, with a bad haircut, it's persecution. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but he, he was so receptive. It was, it was wonderful. When the opportunity, that's what Paul's saying. Seize the moment. Seize the day. Jump into that moment. Redeem the time. And as wise people were to do that because... The days are evil. And the interesting thing about that word evil there, it's actually porneo. The last days will be porneo. And the idea, that idea has a couple of meanings. And um, one of the meanings of that word is that it uh, is an uh, active opposition to that which is good. The last days will be actively in opposition to that which is good. It's like an undercurrent in society that's not content unless it's being destructive to that which is good. Those are the days we're living in. And we know it. You know it. And again, the word porneo, we get the word pornography. Pornographic society, every mobile device now. Anybody can go anywhere and wherever they want to go. The access to pornography is like, al- uh, like a alcohol. It's like vodka coming out of a tap these days. To a, you know, it's just there all the time. He doesn't have to go to the liquor store anymore to buy it. It's right there in front of you all the time. And all that can be imported directly into your mind where it causes so much problem, so much trouble in people's marriages, so much danger in in people's relationship with Jesus, pornography, young kids. The youngest kids these days are getting into pornography at 10, 11 years old. Don't be partakers with any people who are involved in those such things. If we belong to Jesus, he would say this to us, you know what? This is how I want you to live. I want you to walk in a way. I want you to walk circumspectly. I want you to see what's going on. Wake up. Don't be like the fools who have no idea about the world that they are living in. But as being wise, seize the opportunities, all the opportunity you have, seize that opportunity to serve Christ, to live for him. Because you know what? The days you're going to be living in are evil. You're in enemy territory. And this is the environment you will be, this is, what, this is the environment you will be operating in. Verse 17 says, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what is the will of the Lord. Paul tells us that we can know what is the will of the Lord. In other words, God's will for your life is not a mystery. Romans 12 verse 1, we are told how we can experience walking in the will of God. And know that we're in the will of God. And know that this is God's will. This is what it says. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So in the light of all that the Lord has done for us, we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God as he presented his body as a sacrifice for us. He laid it down for us. In the light of that, the only reasonable thing for us to do is do the same thing for him. Become a living sacrifice. Lay down your life as a sacrifice to him. 
And then we're told not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then Paul then goes on to say, as you do that, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is how we can know that we're walking in the will of God. Paul says, this is it. The good and acceptable, perfect will of God for your life personally. You can know you're living in it by these two simple things. First, present your body as a living sacrifice to the Lord, which simply means when you wake up in the morning, we say on a daily basis, Lord, good morning. Good morning, Lord. Here I am, and I give myself to you today. I'm going to live for you. I'm going to seek to be obedient to you. I'm going to seek to serve you and represent you today, Lord. I give my body as a sacrifice. I present myself to you as a living... I surrender to you today, Lord. I don't want this body of mine to be used for sinning. I want it to be used for your purpose. I'm tired of trying to figure out what I should be, where I should go, where I should be. I give it all up to you. I surrender it all to you. I take control of my life. I want to just live for you today, a living sacrifice. Very simple. That's the first step. Then once you've presented your body as a living sacrifice to him, then he says, do not be conformed to the world. In other words, don't let this attitude of the world, this mindset, this worldly attitude, the spirit of this age. Don't let that squeeze you into its mold. But rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So give yourself as a living sacrifice in service and honor his name. And then keep your mind fixed on the Lord. Don't allow your mind to get sucked in with the stuff of this world. The media. Don't spend three or four hours a day on your phone, man. Don't be conformed to this world's way of thinking at all. The stuff that's propagated hour by hour on that little screen. Stuff that's contrary to the word of God and propagates stuff that is proclaiming against God. Magazines, books, YouTube, TikTok, so on. Don't let it squeeze you into its mindset. But rather, keep your mind on the things of God and give, in, give attention to the things of God. And as you do that, then each and every day, as you do that, each and every day then becomes an unfolding of God's will in your life. God's will will unfold before you as you do those two simple things. It just becomes the ongoing unfolding of the will of God as each day you commit yourself to the Lord in that way, you'll know that you're walking right in the center of God's will. We can make the mistake of thinking that the guidance of God, you know, the will of God, has to be some kind of a, a dramatic thing. It, it doesn't have to be that at all, you know. In fact, if we think long, uh, along those kinds of lines, very often we miss the very natural and the very ordinary way that God, how God leads us is a very natural, ordinary thing. But in, in the, uh, the underlying thing is it's a supernatural thing. That's how God does it. So God very often leads us in very natural ways, even though he's actually leading us supernaturally. Well, okay, Pastor, I understand that, but... What about when there are decisions that need to be made and you don't know quite sure which way you should go? Well, this scripture might help you in this. It helps me. Colossians 3.15 And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Another translation puts it this way. Let the peace of God act like an, a, a spiritual umpire in your heart. Settling with finality, all matters that arise in your mind. So we know what an umpire is. An umpire is the guy in the cricket match who says, you're out or you're in, you know. He's safe or you're out. 
So in the same way, the peace of God in our hearts can be a, a spiritual umpire in our walk with God. Let the peace of God be an umpire. The peace of God will help me to determine whether I'm in or out of the will of God. It's a spiritual umpire, the peace of God. One of the ways that God will show us whether we are in his will is by his, uh, us having his peace, you know, in our hearts. If we pray about something, asking the Lord to come, uh, help me make the right decision about a situation, but you don't have a peace about it, that you're not quite sure, I don't have the peace about this, right there, that's an indication from the Lord that this is not his will. Don't do it if you don't have peace. Another translation puts it this way, let the peace of God act like a spiritual umpire, all matters that arise in your mind. And so if today you're entering into a situation but you don't have the assurance from the Holy Spirit that what you're doing is of God, then just simply do this. Put the brakes on. Don't go there. If you don't have God's peace, let the peace of God or the lack of it direct you in that situation. Learn to listen to that still small voice. That's what we have now as Christians. We're, we're in contact with God. Learn to listen to that still small voice within your soul and he will tell you which way you should go if you'll take heed to that still small voice. When God gives us his wisdom on a matter, the spirit of God will bear witness to that in our hearts and it will sit right. It'll just be right. You just know, you know, you just know that you know. Sometimes I may want to do something, but I sense somehow, I'm not quite sure about this. The Spirit of God inside of me isn't saying amen to this. I'm not quite sure. And when that happens, pull back. Because James tells us that the wisdom that comes from a God, from, uh, from above, is peaceable and easily entreated. In other words, the will of God will work out in an easy, peaceable way, un, in an undisturbed manner. You'll have a peace about it. James 3.17 says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, easy to, to follow through. It, it will work in a peaceable manner in your life, the will of God. So I, I just have a suggestion, don't go anywhere. Don't do anything without having God's peace. Don't go anywhere without knowing that God is going with you. Whenever you're thinking about doing something, do not go without the assurance that God has given you his peace about it, his endorsement upon it. Pray until you hear the Lord say, okay, Alwyn, you can go there. You can buy that guitar. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> but we must always wait until you've got God's peace. And until you know in your heart God's peace, that's then the time to go ahead. Seek the Lord. And if you're in doubt, whether you should do nothing, dare to stand still and wait until you know for sure what you should do. Dare to stand still and wait. If God's not giving you his peace, he's giving you time to think it through. For example, if you feel pressured to go in a certain direction, but you haven't had time to discover God's peace about it, you haven't had time, but time is pressing you and it's putting you under pressure that... Uh, it's, it's, it's putting you under pressure for you to decide outside the will or the peace of God. Then don't move, even though you're under pressure, don't go. Let the peace of God be your umpire. If you haven't got time to pray and find God's peace about something, and time is pressing you to make a decision, then by the very fact that you don't have time to seek the Lord about it is an indication from the Lord that this is not God's will. 
Don't move into something that we haven't had time to seek the Lord about and don't move until you have God's peace. It's important. Because, you know, you don't want to be making a direction in your life and then say, Lord, was that you? When you get there, you don't want to marry somebody and then after the wedding say, well, Lord, was that you? You know? You don't want to move into another city and then when you get there, you say, Lord, I'm here now, but Lord, did you really bring me here? You don't want to be doing that. Don't do something without having God's peace and then find yourself later on saying, Lord, was that you? When things start to get tough and difficult, when you have the peace of God before you went, you say, Lord, I don't know what's going on right now, but I know I had your peace when I came here, and I know, therefore, that I'm in your will. So even though it's tough right now, I know that you're with me because you gave me your peace about this. Even though it's tough right now, I know I'm in your will. And if the person you marry without knowing it was God's will, then when things go wrong, then you have no assurance then that you you should have got married in the first place. Don't go until you know God's peace. Therefore, do not be unwise. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation or excess but be filled with the Spirit. In the Roman Empire, you know, Bacchus was uh, worshipped. Bacchus. And so there was this constant drunkenness, you know, in the Roman culture. Because after all, Bacchus was a god. And so there was that constant drunkenness in the, in the culture. Alcohol was the pot of the day. It was the heroine of the day. In the Roman Empire, alcohol was king. And uh, so a good bit of the population of Ephesus were drunk all of the time. And so here, what the Holy Spirit is saying to us, look, you're not, you're not to be children of light in this world. And therefore, I don't want you to be under, conf- under the control of any of those things. I don't want you to be drunk but under the control of any intoxicants like that, whether it be alcohol, marijuana, legal highs, prescription drugs, any drugs. I don't want you to be controlled by any, but rather I want you to be under my control all of the time. I want you to be under my influence. That's what the Spirit of God is saying here. Now, if you have a glass of wine, you know, It doesn't mean to say that you're sinning. It depends how big the glass is. You know what I mean? (laughs) But uh, the Bible doesn't teach that. I believe Jesus drank wine, wine, wine. But the issue here is not to be under the control of something that affects you and your personality, that changes you. And and drunkenness, and drunken, (laughs) drunken does, it, it does that. It changes your personality. You see people who are normally passive and timid take a drink and suddenly they want to fight the world. You know? Get rowdy and get noisy and they want to fight everybody. You see somebody who laughs all the time, suddenly they start crying. (laughs) You're my best friend. What's your name again? You know? (laughs) Stuff like that. They no longer have control, you know? They can't walk straight. They, They become a danger not only to others but to themselves. It changes, it alters their personality, it alters who they are. That's the kind of thing that's being talked about here when it says don't be drunk with wine. It's drunkenness. A glass of wine fine with your meal, whatever. But be filled, be controlled by the Holy Spirit all the time. And so he's saying, look, let me, let me be the one. Don't let that stuff change you. Let me be the one who changes you. Let me be the one who changes your personality and affects the way you, be, the, you behave. 
Don't get to the point where you're controlled by other things, but instead, I want you to be under my control. I want you to be under my influence all of the time, you see. Don't be drunk with wine in which is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Interesting. The idea is there is be filled with the Spirit, is continually filled with the Spirit. Be continually being filled with the Spirit. That's the idea. And when we become born again of the Spirit, we are at that very moment baptized into the mystical body of Christ. And that's a one-time, never-to-be-repeated occurrence. Once you're saved, born again of the Spirit, you're saved until the day of redemption. It's a one-time event if you're genuinely born again. But our being filled by the Holy Spirit is an ongoing Continue be being filled. That's the, that's the word. Being filled. Again and again, continually being filled. Asking the Lord to continually be filling us with his spirit. We need fresh pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Every day, Lord, do that in me as I present my body to you as a living sacrifice. Fill me with your spirit again and again. Peter, when he stood up on the day of Pentecost... He was filled with the Spirit. When he was at the gate, beautiful. The, the man there was healed. Everybody comes running towards Peter. As Peter stands up to address the religious crowd, it says, Peter, filled with the Spirit, said to them. And what that means is at that moment when he began to speak, the Spirit filled him again. He had a brand new experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit right there as he stood up in Acts 4, verse 8. Again in Acts 4, 29. The disciples are gathered together. They've been threatened. So they began to pray. Lord, look upon their threats. Grant to your servants with all boldness to speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And then, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This is after Pentecost. They were filled with the Holy Spirit again. Baptized in the Holy Spirit again and again. Peter was filled with the Spirit, filled again. When he spoke before the Sanhedrin, he was filled again with the Holy Spirit. We need fresh outpourings of the Holy Spirit, and we need to be asking for that every day. We've got a relationship with the Holy Spirit. How many times do we come across people who say, oh yeah, I'm a spirit-filled Christian, and yet they're living in total compromise? A spirit-filled Christian is not just a title. It's a condition that we're to be in, where the Holy Spirit is in control of our lives. We read about the Pharisees being filled with envy, and what the idea is, they were continually filled with envy all the time, over and over again because of Jesus. They were controlled by their envy. And so it says here, we should be continually filled, controlled over and over again by the Spirit. We don't have any power to be able to do that. That's something that he does. We get filled by the Lord and we just receive it as the Lord gives it. We're the recipients of it. And so as God's people, we're to be asking for the power of the Holy Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine, which is excess, but be continually being filled with the Spirit. And now we get on to what the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit looks like. Be filled with the Spirit, which will manifest itself in this way speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord from your heart. I love it when we worship the Lord here. But I love that scripture that says, make a joyful noise. Because some of us don't. You know, we can't sing. You know, we can't sing for to save our lives. I remember when I first started doing worship here, there was somebody on this side singing and they were so out of tune. I couldn't sing in tune either. I was like, ah, you know, it's like, 
But I love the fact that the Lord says we have to make a joyful noise, you know. He doesn't say that we need to be like Pavarotti, you know, or Mary, you know, Carey, Mary Carey or whatever. If you can sing well or not, it doesn't matter. We are to make a joyful noise. Just do it. Go for it. In church, when we're together, we're family. Make a joyful noise. We might be way off key and cause the first six rows of the church to be off key. But the fact is, if it's from your heart, it brings pleasure to God, no matter what key it's in. Sing up, man. Just go for it. Just let it all go. Sing. The Lord doesn't care much about the quality of the voice. He, he cares about the quality of the heart behind the voice, you know. People analyze the quality of people's voices. Oh, he can really hit those notes. But when, but whereas God, man looks upon the outward appearance, God looks upon the heart. I like what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, you know, God made the nightingale, but he also made the rook and the raven. And God appreciates all their songs just as much as he does the nightingale. The Bible tells us that what we are, uh, that it is the fervent prayer of the righteous that avails much. In other words, only heartfelt prayer, worship from the heart, the kind of worship and prayer that you put yourself into, that's the kind of worship and prayer that means something to God when you put your heart into it. So just let it go, man, when you, when you come and worship the Lord, praise. I remember when the Jesus movement happened, you know, people would be singing before the service started. They used to sing songs, just singing all these songs before the, the service even started. They were worshiping the Lord. That's how you can recognize a spirit-filled church, you know, those kinds of things. You know, before the Reformation, the church choir sang and the congregation had to listen. The average person didn't, you know, didn't participate in any worship in the church at all. They just listened to the choir. As the musicians performed. But you know what? It's God's desire that the whole congregation becomes his choir. Where God himself is the audience. He's the audience. It's, it's, it's God's house. Let us continually offer sacrifices of praise to the Lord. And then here, let's close this out. Verse 19, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, making melody in your heart. So there's a joy, a joyfulness about a spirit-filled congregation. Thankful, joyful. Not complaining, Murmuring, you know, you've seen Eeyore, you know, the miserable one in Winnie the Pooh. Well, I'm a Christian now. Praise God, it's really wonderful. <sighs> you know what? You need to get saved and be just like me. And the person you're talking to is thinking, I don't think so, my man. <laughs> Whatever it is that you've got, you just keep it to yourself. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. A Christian should be joyful where there's something going on between you and Jesus in your heart. The Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice, you know. Yeah, but pastor, I hear you, but you know, I, I had a lousy day. And it's easy for you to say, he, Paul didn't have a wife and kids and he didn't have a mortgage. He, he didn't have any of the re responsibilities. It's easy for you to talk. Well, wait a minute. Paul didn't say rejoice in your circumstances. He says rejoice in the Lord always. And what he's getting at is no matter what your circumstances are, when we belong to Jesus, there's always something about him that we can rejoice over. You can rejoice over the very fact that he loved us enough 
to call us into his family and to come and die for us on the cross, that he saved us. And one day we're going to be with him eternally in heaven. We're going to see him eye to eye. We can say, Lord, thank you. When I'm in heaven, I don't have to do this lousy job anymore. There's always something. We can rejoice that one day we're going to be together around the throne of God, all of us, the people we've loved and lost. We rejoice over our citizenship in heaven, waiting, looking constantly for Jesus to come. You see, in Christ, we have much to rejoice over, even if the circumstances in life are not good. We can always rejoice in the Lord no matter what. There's something about him that could cause us to think, say, thank you, Jesus. When I first became a, a Christian, I worked in a construction. I was apprentice brick, bricklayer. I was cutting some breeze blocks with this heavy lump hammer. And I just happened to hit my thumb with this hammer that day. And my, and I, my thumb just happened to explode like a grape somehow. And you know, when that happens, you don't say, oh, <laughs> rejoice. <laughs> you know, other words try to get from your lips at that point. Look at, look at that man, look at, it's just like, it's squashed like a grape, isn't that? Rejoice in that. There was another time I stood on a rusty nail, went right through my foot. I didn't say, oh, just look how beautiful that color of red is soaking, <laughs> soaking into my socks. So, you know, I'm rejoicing. No, that's not what Paul is saying. He didn't say rejoice over the circumstance you're in. He says rejoice always in the Lord. No matter how difficult it might be, there's always something we can rejoice about when we belong to Jesus. When our circumstances, there's nothing to rejoice. We can always rejoice about Jesus. That's what he's saying. And it's, not, it's only in Christ that we can always find something to rejoice about because Jesus is the joy of our lives. And finally, verse 20. This is what being filled with the Holy Spirit looks like. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Being filled with the Holy Spirit should produce in us a heart of gratitude always. For what we are in Christ, for what we have in life, for the life we've had, for the kids we've had, the children around us. Everything, in everything, give thanks. First Thessalonians 5.18 For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do you want to know what God's will for your life is? God's will for your life is, is that you will be always thankful, grateful, thankful person at all times. We've got so much to be thankful for. We fail to realize it many times because it's so miserable we can't see anything else. I wonder just how many people realize that everything that we have that's good in life, it all comes from God. That's where it comes from. Everything that we have. When we sit down to pray, giving thanks for my dinner, I look at that food on my plate and I think, you know what? This is nice codfish. This came out of the ocean. God put the codfish in the ocean. He gave the ocean in the first place. These peas, they came out of the ground. God created the seeds that produced those peas. I start looking around the food on my plate. I start to realize that I could have nothing other than what God has created. So it all comes from him. If he didn't create it for me, I wouldn't have it, you know? And I think it's a good idea just to keep in mind, to stop and realize that everything we have is actually given to you by God. And immediately that causes, that causes me to have a grateful attitude. My wife, my kids, my hi-fi set, my car, whatever it might be. Jesus, everything that's good in my life comes from him. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, the one who created all the lights in the universe. That's what it means. The car you drive, oh, well, I got that car, but I got that myself, you know. God didn't have anything to do with that. You know, I, I earned it, I, I worked out, yeah, yeah. Well, he had a lot more to do with that than you think. All the material in your car belongs to him. 
the metal, the rubber, everything that went into making your car, where did it come from? It came from God. It came from the earth. Where did the earth come from? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. All the people who assembled it, he gave them strength and skills to develop in order to produce that thing. He also gave you the food and the strength and the know-how to do your job that enabled you now to be able to pay for that thing. You can never say God has done nothing for you. You can never say it. You can do nothing and you would have nothing if it weren't for the goodness of God in your life. Even though you blaspheme his name, it's still good to you. Like it or not, believer or atheist, you are completely dependent upon God for everything you have and everything that you are. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above. Thanksgiving, thankful heart. And you know, that should be a, a mark in our lives. Thanks, uh, thankfulness. There should be a humble thankfulness about us, you know. And I do, I do hope that you and I are growing in our ability to worship God and to praise God and to thank him for all that he means to us and what he's done for us. You know, my prayer for this church, my prayer for this church is simply this, that this would be a church where people can come Worship God, praise him with everything that is within them. And where they would, through the word of God, get to know God, get to know him well, and through getting to know him, be able to worship him in thankfulness, the attitude of our church, love, peace, thank, thankful for what he's done. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. That's the primary, primary evidence of it. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Bless your church, Lord. Here we are in the middle of London. People can't get in unless they pay their congestion charges and stuff like that. It's not an easy place to be, but you are faithful and we are thankful for what you have done. We thank you for our lives. Thank you for our homes. Thank you for our friends that we're able to earn a bit of money. We thank you, Lord, that we're able to give some to you because we appreciate you. We're thankful towards you. And so, Father, we today use us, Lord, as, as we've read here, as a living sacrifice, serving you, honoring you, in, the, in what we do, what we read, what we look at, everything, Lord. We want you to be in control. We want to come under your control. Fill us, baptize us with your spirit. And bless your people today. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys. Have a beautiful day today.